Hello and welcome to the Brenton podcast series. I am delighted to be joined today by Stuart Fox. Um, very special week, uh, Stuart. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, obviously, you're marking the first anniversary uh, as a standalone business. Um, Stuart, give us an update. H how's things gone in that first year? Yeah, no, thanks, Dan. Nice to meet you again. Yeah, so that first year has been tremendously exciting and rewarding. Um, and at the same time, it's also been challenging. You know, we have the, the whole COVID pandemic still rolling on. Now, of course, we have tr trouble in Europe. Um, but overall, it's been a fantastic year. I mean, we were basically um, left ESCO, our previous owners, and we're really kind of like a mature startup. You know, we had a lot of people, a lot of um, uh, products that we knew, but we had to build systems and processes. Uh, everything from finance reporting to our databases had to be, um, you know, re refined, refreshed, renewed. Um, but the team came together. So we came from really a standing start in April um, and had to pull everything together very quickly. So that was a challenging and stressful time, I think, for the whole team. Um, but really, congratulations for them for coming together, showing their, their knowledge, their, their um, professionalism to really you know, bring the company together um, and deliver you know, a fantastic year for us. And, and Stuart, um, you really hit the ground running um, because obviously there was a couple of um, sort of landmark uh, acquisitions that took place. Uh, tell us about those. Yeah, well, actually, you know, a year ago we were chatting uh, and actually you brought up, you know, what we're doing with adjacent markets. And of course, I was under a confidentiality agreement, so I couldn't tell you at the time. We were already starting to look to acquire Multicamp this time last year. So... Um, that came very, very quickly. It was a, we saw it as a fantastic opportunity. Um, we didn't think it was going to come up quite so quickly, um, but literally we, we inquired with the, the prior owners and they said, actually, we're preparing to sell. So the timing's perfect. So it was perfect from the sale, selling side, um, but we were very, you know, we, you know, the actual acquisition closed only four months into us being a standalone company. So that was... Um, overwhelming in some cases you know for the amount of data that needed processing um but it's such it was such a great opportunity and has turned out to be a great opportunity for us as well so you know we've been working very hard in the previous six or seven months to get the integration going um you know despite not being able to travel for the first three or four months it was only end of november before i actually got to texas so um it's kind of tricky to do an integration um virtually um, but we, you know, we, we made some progress um, and we delayed some things we knew that we wanted to do in person. So in some ways, it took the pressure off that integration of the two companies. However, you know, it was a challenge from a business point of view to bring all these systems together. And, you know, we've got work to do still. And um, obviously, you talk there a little bit about integration. Um, obviously, over the course of the last 12 months, um, you, you've gone from effectively everyone working from home where they can and now trying to bring people back yeah. into, into the offices. Um, obviously, then integrating a business that effectively I know you had a relationship with before, but, you know, to, to bring um different people different skill sets in in a virtual environment how, how did you find that well it, i think uh, just to take a step back you know that whole process of how do we bring the workforce back on the certainly on the kongsberg side we've done it we've done it we've really basically changed the way we we're going to be more flexible for the employees so for some days they wish to work from home you know we really want them to be some days of the week in the office we see the value in having face-to-face -face discussions interacting with your colleagues, interacting with human beings, I think is an important thing. So I think we've, we've recognized that we need to have a new model for working, you know, going forward. Then you, then you look at the multicam acquisition and there you have people like salespeople who have been working remotely, but the majority of the team went to the office and went to the factory. So it's been a bit of a change for them um, to, to use Teams or to use Zoom to, 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 um, to connect and communicate. But they're very adaptable. They've picked it up very quickly now. They, you know, like we, what we did on the Kongsberg side, you just call somebody on Teams and have a quick chat for two minutes and hang up, you know, and that, that kind of um, uh, flexibility soon, soon, you know, it soon took hold with the whole team now. So we, we, we have um, many meetings virtual. I, I still try every five weeks to go and spend two weeks in Dallas just because there's, there's so many great things to do 
you know, and, and you know, just talking about virtual things, we do a lot of meetings virtual. We actually ran an R and D workshop there three weeks ago, but we thought let's try and do that face to face. So you know, we brought a team of people together, some people from Europe, some people from the states together, uh, and had it in a meeting room, which was great. It was a four four day interactive R and D workshop. And, and uh, you know, you're talking there uh, about the use of um, you know modern technology for for communications. Um, uh, obviously, during the the last you know eighteen months or so, you've obviously had to showcase a lot of your equipment uh, virtually um, through you know online demos, etc. But um, I, I saw also um, another piece of news just saying um, there's been a significant um, announcement regarding your demo centres, and you've now partnered with uh, a series of um, customers and other distributors, etc. Yes. Yeah. Um, so tell us about the the demo centres for EMEA. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the base, the fundamental reason for doing that is that, you know, whether it's buying a cutting machine, you know, whether it's a, a plasma laser router, you know, packaging digital finishing machine, ultimately somebody wants to go and see it at some point. It's not like buying, you know, a movie on Netflix or ordering your shopping from Ocado online. You actually want to go and see it and test your material um, and have it. And we've got a fantastic demo center in Ghent. But sometimes it's just not practical for people to come to Ghent. So we wanted to be able to expand that in Europe and allow customers an easier access to a demo center. So equip these, these customers or these um, partners with our latest equipment and tooling and, you know, and just give them the ability to, to, to conduct or for customers to visit those demo centers. And in some cases, they'll, they'll receive the demo in a local language language as well. So it becomes easier from that point of view. And um, j just run through where they are, because I know you've got some in Israel, um, in Europe, and, and yeah. I think in South Africa as well, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've actually just uh, signed up a reseller, a GSW down, a distributor down in South Africa that will provide that for us. Um, and I think we've got, um, I'm just thinking Dubai, a UAE, Finland, um, I think in Estonia as well. You forgive me for not remembering all of them, but like you said, Israel as well. Um, and we just mentioned GSW in Cape Town. So it's, you know, it's, it just gives the customer more access to our equipment. And, and it isn't just for demo centers because some demo demonstration purposes and uh, pre-sale, sometimes customers have an application that they want some help with and they want to say, can I, can I come to your, can I come to you to meet your experts, your application people, bring this material, which maybe they, they haven't cut before or haven't converted before. And they wanted to see what's the best way of getting the best results from that. Uh, and that brings us on to, to, to Multicam. So Multicam as well moved to a more virtual world. They have a demo center in Dallas, in Texas. Um, and, and in there, customers can come for a pre-sale demonstration, but also for application training there. And we run events there for customers as well. And of course, we also have an office in Miamisburg in Ohio, where you can customers can also come and receive a demonstration of or, or application training with one of our uh, application specialists. So for us, it's all about providing access to us, the people and the machinery to be for customers to, to understand, you know, how do they get the best for their business. Now, um, Stuart, I want to move a little bit on to industry in general now, um, obviously specifically yeah. the packaging sector, but, um, I've, I've been very lucky. I've, I've managed to get to a, a couple of sort of face-to-face, -face, um, uh, you know, industry conferences, etc. And everyone's still talking about, you know, Industry 4.0, um, the drive towards data, you know, what to do with that data. Um, obviously, you know, digitalization of of a you know, traditionally analog business um, is it, obviously quite scary for some some converters. So. Try and give us your viewpoint on, on what you think digitalization actually means for the corrugated and the folding carton industries. Well, I think, I mean, digitalization is such a broad term. So, you know, you can go back 25 years and talk about the first um, CAD software, right? So now you're moving from a drawing board, 30 years ago, moving from a drawing board with, you know, rotary pens and pencils moving to digitizing that design into an electronic version so it, it you know you know 4.0 isn't happening overnight you're seeing the emergence of digital print and we're still learning how to use and deploy that to really meet the customer's needs 
customers are still switching on to how they can have the low SKU count, right, on the, in their warehouse or in the converter's warehouse and what it means to them. So there's some way, you know, there's quite some way in many years to go yet. But I think whether it's CAD drawings, pre-pressed software, imaging, even imaging of flexo plates, right? I mean, that's digitized up to the point of making the flexo plate, you know, actually imaging the mask, ablating the mask there. Um, so it's, it's a little bit, I, I compared, I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, Dan, you know, when I first got my mobile phone, I could have put all the numbers in there, right? But actually I had a little, I've still got it somewhere, like a little wallet with business cards in, right? So I would just look for the, so, so I didn't actually digitize then, but then, you know, the iPhone came, you know, and then everything, you can just scan it and get it in your phone, right? So that you just, you, you move there. But, you know, that's what, when's my first mobile phone? Late 80s to 2008, you know, 20 years for me to digitize my address book. And now I, I can't go back. Every device I own, it's synced on, right? And I think that's, that's kind of a metaphor for how it, it's going to be. Like parts of the industry are digitized now. You know, we have, um, you know, we, we make products for digital finishing. So everything has to reach us in a digital form, apart from the material. You're never going to have, obviously, digital material. But the file, the graphics, the alignment, that's all going to be controlled um, from digital files. And those digital files will come from a digital pre-press uh, studio, which will have gone off to your, your press um, or, or your Flexo machine, right? If you're making Flexo plates, it could have gone that way. And then the file's gone off to um, uh, the die files and come off to your Kongsberg table for cutting. So I think it's a little bit more like, I don't see it as a, I see it as a revolution in terms of what it can achieve, but it's going to happen over a longer period of time. Now, I actually think that suits certainly the corrugated industry where you've got huge investments in a lot of the converting machines, you need 10 or 15 years use of that machine. So um, to, to get a good ROI and to generate good, good contributions for your business. So actually having a slower, I say slower advisedly here, but a somewhat um, gradual um, move to digitization, whether it's print or files or cutting actually will, will suit the industry very well. Yeah, because if, if you look at, uh, you know, you, you touched on, um, you know, the digitization of, of, you know, moving from traditional pen and paper effectively yeah. through CAD CAM and, and obviously, you know, digital elements were, were really in the, the sort of the repro and the pre-press side of things first. Um, but then you, you look at the development of MIS, you know, you look at your Kiwi plans and your, um, you know, EFIs and yeah. your prod software as they are now. Uh, you look at all of those kind of products, you know, what, what we've been doing is creating lots of data center points within our business. And I guess the big challenge is, you know, for some companies, it's, well, what do you do with that data? Yeah. Um, but then secondly, it's how do you tie it all together? Um, and, and obviously, the, you know, there's something else that's happened in the last uh, 18 months as well in terms of, you know, when we look <laughs> at industry in general, um, and th this is across all sectors, um, there's this awful term of, of um, you know, de-skilling and, and shortage of, of skill sets. We've taken, you know, some people who've, you know, taken early retirement just because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And our industry has lost a lot of skill sets. So where do you feel that, you know, particularly from the digital finishing side of things and maybe even digital printing, wh wh where do you think the industry will benefit from the in integration of this technology? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's quite a big topic, actually. I mean, I actually think the re you could say it's de-skilling, but it's also, I prefer the term reskilling, because, you know, you might take somebody who's operated a traditional die press in the past, and they move and they train to a Kongsberg. So yes, they're no longer using some of the skills they acquired to run their die press, but now they're going to have to learn how to open a multi-layered PDF or a CAD file and and decide which way this machine is going to crease in which direction with the flute against the flute which pressure to apply there so they're going to move and have new skills um, but actually their, their life as an operator should be easier i mean our job as kongsberg is to make uh, our products as intuitive as, pos as possible but still retaining the control where that that you know that packaging um company wants to really specifically have the creasing happen in a certain way with a certain pressure uh, in a certain direction you know maybe they've got a dry liner or something on some older material they want to they want to respect and be careful with so we we take 
what was perhaps contained in somebody's head before and try and translate that into the software and then still give the operator access to those functions in there. But really, I think it's reskilling. Now, to your point on all the data, I mean, one of the um, learnings, let's say, for the last year for me is that it's exactly what you said. We have all this data from finance, from Salesforce, from a number of places. What do you do with it? Because there's gems in that data that can really um, guide your business. So, you know, from that, we started a project and said, how do we pull it together? So we've used, we're using some external an external company to help us develop um, like a business intelligence tool where we can collect that and dashboard that how we want to see it and it will help drive the direction of our business so some of that information will filter down to r d to manufacturing procurement we will see trends in there that we never we never believe and actually we've we've always had the data <laughs> we just never processed it in the way so i think that that's going to happen for all companies. And you see that in some of the bigger converters today. They already have um, uh, data IT teams that help them do that number crunching. But I think going forward, it's going to be critical for all businesses because you're going to have orders coming in online, um, not coming in a traditional method. It's all going to go into an ERP system. You know, you need, we're going to need to mine that data. There's perhaps an opportunity for, a, for an IT software company to, to, to create something that actually can pull that data uh, and actually give insights and intelligence. But I think it's going to be a critical part for any business to find a way to effectively mine the data that they, they have coming into their business. And, and, you know, this almost is, it sounds like the golden opportunity for uh, what's traditionally a, you know, dirty, um, ugly business, you know, <laughs> making boxes, whether it's boxes or cartons. Uh, do, do you see this as, as a great opportunity for marketing to the next generation of, of operator that is very much, you know, touch of a button, it's all very intuitive, all iPhone friendly. Do, do, do you think this is where we've now got to jump up and grab it? I think I think so. I think I think there's a certainly I can only speak for really Kongsberg. And I think when we talk about what what attracts um you know potential recruits employees to join us it, it's having technologies that are um i'll give you an example actually we've just we've just started looking at our new next generation of products from an industrial design point of view and we've gone out and, and we we genuinely want our products to contain more recycled materials to start with and contain more materials that are readily recycled and that's one of the briefs we've given the industrial design company we want to be able to increase the amount of recycled material and make our products in, um, easier to recycle. Why do we want to do that? Not just It's not just a box ticking exercise because we know that's where we want to go. That's what new people, younger people joining Kongsberg really want to do. They want to work for a company that's going to, going to push the boundaries of that. And it's going to be difficult and it's probably going to cost us money to do that, but it's the right thing to do as well. You know, we want to be an ethical company here as well. Now, what does that mean? That's just one facet of designing products that will appeal to people to use, to be associated with, to want to work with. Now, whether that's, like you said, the iPhone generation, making the software really funky to use, intellectually um, uh, great, uh, challenging, you know, it's graphically attractive, et cetera, that's also on us to do. Um, and I think packaging, certainly paper-based packaging, so corrugated folding carton, has a wonderful opportunity because it is such a recyclable product. You know, we can, we can let you, I'll tell you always, we can grasp this opportunity, right? And, and really um, move the packaging market in the direction of, um, I don't want to say it's a, a grubby industry like or dirty industry, because I actually think the packaging industry for many years has actually, you know, because of, you know, whether it's a food hygiene, has been a really clean environment. It's just big machines, isn't it? It's big, noisy machines. But um, no, I think it's a great opportunity for us to encourage young people to look at the packaging industry and consider it as a career. I mean, if you look at some of the designs you now see in store, I pick, up, pick one that everybody picks, but I've just seen it at least recently, the latest Mac Studio, the box that it comes in. I don't know if you've seen it, it opens, it opens like a flower petal and releases the product. I'm like, somebody spent a lot of time designing that. And it fits beautifully. You know, and that, that's got to be something that you want to be involved in, right? From the, you know, you can throw it in the trash and it will be compostable. And it also, I mean, like me and my kids, we keep our iPhone boxes because they're, they're a work of art, right? And if you want to sell your phone later, if it's got the packaging, you get more money for it. Whoever thought that would be the case? 
<laughs> no, absolutely. And, and, and Stuart, it's very interesting because when you were talking there about, um, you know, giving the brief to, to your, you know, design engineers in terms of, you know, how to, you know, reuse, upcycle, etc. You know, in terms of, you know, the, the sort of global supply chain issues that we're all facing as an industry, um, obviously that, that kind of brings things to the fore, doesn't it, in terms of, you know, taking existing tables and retrofitting and upgrading and yep. you know, rewiring, putting new systems into existing frames. That, that's obviously something that you guys have been doing for some time anyway. It, it is, but I think we can do more. Right? I mean, it's easy to rest on your laurels and say, yeah, you can you can have a Kongsberg that's 15 years old and we'll change the PC and we'll put you on the latest software and we'll upgrade this and we'll put you the latest tools on there. It's that's great. And we could just say that's enough. But actually, I want to say that those I want those frames to already contain more recycled steel. I want the plastic covers to either be very easily recycled, you know, like an aluminium cover. But if it's plastic, why can't it already have been recycled once? You know, I think that's, you know, we really want to design products that are fit for the, you know, 22nd, 23rd century, right? We want, we want products that we, we, no, we all, all want to be proud of our products, but actually um, we don't want to rest on our laurels. We really do want to, you know, push um, some of our own ideals and, you know, uh, desires to the front. And, and um, just to wrap up, Stuart, I mean, obviously, um, corrugated folding carton, you know, fibre-based packaging is, is probably the largest part of your business, but there are other sectors too. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what you're up to and, and some of the growth opportunities you've got yeah. um, for the year ahead. Yeah, so, of course, so let's, I won't say ignore, but let's push the packaging to one side. And then, of course, you have, um, you know, what we would call sign and display the traditional markets for us. Um, but now we also have, with uh, certainly with the acquisition of Multicam, you know, we have customers that are making sails for yachts. We have customers that are cutting decking, you know, to go on the, the fiberglass decks of um, uh, like a non, non-slip grip, you know, grippy decking to go on there. Um, people making HVAC panels, you know, for uh, routing out HV, uh, high, you know, air conditioning units. It's a real diverse portfolio and of course I knew some of this last April when we were talking last year um, but it, it is as it is as exciting and diverse as we hoped it was it would be uh, and opened us up to shows we've never you know did you know in Dusseldorf there's a show called Fabtech you know it's 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 like a drooper right or an interpack but it's for fabrication <laughs> metal fabric and uh, fabrication of anything actually so it's a, it's a whole different world, right? It's like we've gone down the rabbit hole here, um, but extremely exciting. Um, and of course, you know, Multicam and Kongsberg together have such a diverse selection of tooling. You know, we're now the, on, from the, the Kongsberg engineer side, they're opened up to these different applications, which Multicam were, you know, plasma and water jet, you know, laser, um, and even really, you know, high power industrial routers doing some very, you know, woodwork you know 3d routing things that we weren't exposed to before so it's given us a, a tremendous insight and excitement in the team actually to see the diversity out there well Stuart thank you so much indeed it's been great to catch up um after uh, that first 12 months uh, under your uh, under your guide guidance and uh, listen Best of luck for the coming year, and I will look forward to seeing you, I'm sure, face-to-face uh, -face at some of the exhibitions uh, coming up uh, over the course of the next 12 months. No, fantastic. Nice to catch up, Dan, and yeah, look forward to, to meeting in person again. Thank you very much.